Father, thank you for your word. And whatever your word wants to teach us tonight, please, may each person's spirit receive it in the manner of which you have decided it to be. Because we stand on the promise of your word, like the rain that comes forth and gives bread and water. So too, your word will not return void. And if there is someone here that needs to be rebuked by your word, may they receive rebuke. And if there's somebody here that needs to be encouraged, may they receive encouragement. If there's somebody here that needs to just receive salvation, may it be your word that melts them, not my silly words or stories or anything else. God, may it be your power that changes the destination of a soul from hell to heaven tonight. Because it's by your blood that we live and move and have our being. It's by the forgiveness of the power of your blood that we have access. So have your way, Holy Spirit, in each and every soul in this place today. We ask it to the glory of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. Verse 12 of chapter 27, because if you guys remember, we picked, we picked up from there. We, we left off from there a few weeks ago before the prayer meeting. Verse 12 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this Mount Abram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Please give me your attention. Forty years the children of Israel have been going through. If you've been here week in and week out, we've seen the children of Israel go through some turmoil. Well, finally, they reach the promised land. It's just across the water. Do you know what Moses has dealt with, what he's put up with, what he has had to burden, what he has had to shoulder? Finally, it's right there. Think about the, the wedding of your life. Think about the day of your wedding for you that are married. You're, you're. There it is. He says, I want you to go up on the mountain. And I want you to look over at the promised land, this mountain that oversees. He looks down at the mountain, and the Lord says to him, And when thou hast seen it, verse 13, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. Please give me your attention. You know what he says to him? He says, you see it? You ain't going in it. As soon as you see it, you're dying. Just like your brother Aaron died before he went in. Now, I want you to, I want to set you up here a little bit. Imagine 40 years serving God faithfully. Imagine 40 years shouldering, bearing, if you will, the needs and the burdens. Remember, I, I don't remember what chapter it was from the book of Exodus. At one point, Moses says, Did I conceive all these people? <laughs> Did I make them? Are they mine? that you burden me with them? What do I have to do? You know what? I got a better idea, God. Just kill me now so I don't have to see my own wretchedness. But 40 years he endured. What do you say to God? Wait a second. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. What? I have to die before. I've waited this long to see the promised land. Now, let me explain to you what you have. You have two different kinds of hearts in a situation like this. One is the heart of a good shepherd. The other is the heart of a good leader. A good shepherd, a good leader. A good leader wants to lead. He wants to, come on with me, we'll do it. Not a bad heart to have. It's a good heart to have. But there is a depth that most mothers understand. In talking to a, I have a salesperson, comes to my store every two weeks. His name's Jeremy, great guy, sells us our products. I ask him how his life's doing. He goes, yeah, it's good. I said, Jeremy, how's your life doing? He said, marriage, huh? Because we just can't get along. He says, what you thinking about? You can't make it like this. I can't, I can't do this to my kid, he says. I said, Jeremy... Would you take a bullet for your kid? He goes, yeah. I said, no, I'm serious. Somebody comes up and he puts a gun to your head and gun to your kid's head. Got one bullet, who's taking it? He goes, I'd take it in a second. I'd take two of them. I said, then take this bullet for your kid. He goes, what do you mean? I said, do you have any idea the statistics on what divorce does to a child? Take the bullet, man. 
take the death. If you're willing to die for your kid, be willing to live for your kid. He goes, no, I think it's worse because my kid is seeing us fight. I says, no, it's not. Let him see you fight. Learn how not to fight. Do something crazy. Do something dry. Go to church. Get counsel. Whatever you have to do, do not divorce. This is the difference, guys. The heart of a shepherd says, I will die for my child, even if it means I have to live for my child. The heart of a leader says, nah, I'm going to lead, but I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to pull them with me. Both are good. Not, one is not benevolent and the other one isn't malevolent. But the heart of a leader isn't willing to die. He wants to go and see the promised land too. Look at the difference here. Now, let's stop one second. Let me explain something to you. Completely off subject, we're going to come back to the subject. You see what God said to Moses here? This is phenomenal. He says, You shall also be gathered unto thy people. Gathered unto thy people. What a promise. What a promise. I want that to be said on my gravestone. Gathered unto his people. Now, I don't know about you if you follow like your family tree or anything like that. I really haven't. I know who my grandfather is. He was. You guys know the story about him. I know who my father is, of course. I know who the kids are that I was a part of their abortion. I know who my brothers are who are dead. My, my blood brothers as well as my Christian brothers, Tony, who used to sit right there every week. I, I'm going to be gathered unto those people. Huh, that's cool. I love that saying, gathered. He didn't say you're going to die. Because you don't die. There's no death for a Christian. We gathered unto my people. It kind of diffuses that 600-pound gorilla that sits in the room that nobody talks about. You guys have heard that saying? Death is like a 600-pound gorilla. He sits on the living room couch and nobody ever talks about him. I love it when Pastor Bob used to always say, he used to say, it's funny. Statistics shouldn't shock or surprise you. Ten out of ten people die. But we don't talk about it. Good thing. Christians don't have to talk about it because I'm not going to die. I'm going to be gathered unto my people. Imagine the people Moses was going to be gathered unto. You know, I want to be there in that room. I don't even want to be a part of the conversation. Man, I just want to be in Moses, Noah. I mean, think about it. Isaiah. Think about the company that this dude keeps in heaven. What would you do for the Lord? <laughs> Him and David having a conversation. You ever shepherd a people, David? Yeah. That was some psalm you wrote. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. That's good. That's good. You wrote that? Yeah. Don't you have a Bible up in heaven? Back to the story. Verse 13 again, and when thou hast seen it, thou also shall be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. And he's basically saying, you're going to see Aaron again. I love that. 14, for ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Merib in Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. You guys remember the story? It's just a couple of months ago we, we looked at it. He said, Moses, I want you to go speak to the rock. The people are complaining. There's three million people. They got no water. They got, they complaining. I want you to speak to the rock. He goes, yeah, I'll speak to the rock. He goes up on the rock and he goes, bang, and out flows the water. And the people drink. What do I got to do with you? He tells them. I'm sick and tired. That one slip, that one mistake, that one, you think God would forgive him for that? I mean, isn't that kind of mean? I mean, honestly, after all the stuff he forgave the Israelites out of, now all of a sudden, just because Moses does something a little bit, let me tell you, as a pastor, warns the heck out of me. You be careful. You be careful. You strike that rock once, and many live. You strike it twice, and you die. He was only struck 
once. He died once for sin. Once. But was Moses a leader? Did he lead three million people into the desert? Or did he shepherd three million people into the desert? That's the question. That's the question about the heart of a woman, how she does her children. This truly is something... Listen, before we even go on the rest of the story, and I tell you, the Lord Jesus was the good shepherd, was he not? He said, I could stick around here forever and shepherd these people into the promised land. Does not the Bible promise that you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living? I can shepherd them, or I could lead them. You lead the flock, you shepherd the flock. Our Lord Jesus, he knew something about being a shepherd. A leader is not a multifaceted, multi-level person. He knows how to lead. He knows how to even walk. But a shepherd, man. Look, verse 15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, I love that for the name of God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep, which have no shepherd. Please give me your attention. Did you hear him complain? Not a word. Did you hear him say, oh man, what? Nothing. You know what he was concerned about? The people will not have a shepherd. Please, wait, okay, no problem. I got no problem with that. Set a man who will lead them in, lead them out, give them another shepherd. Now, it might sound to some of you like, Okay, what's the point here? Is it, listen to me. Before tonight's over, I'm going to ask you, do you have a shepherd? Do you have a leader? Are you being shepherded? Are you being led? I want you to know, young men, you must find yourself a, what we call in Christian circles, a Paul. You need a Paul. A Paul is somebody who had a Timothy who he can pour his life into and raise up. It was Warren Wiersbe in his book on being a servant of God. He says, if your ministry needs you to survive, you've already failed. If your ministry needs you to survive, you've already failed. What is my job here? My job here isn't to lead you. It's to shepherd you. My job here, according to the Bible, is to prepare the work for the saints of the ministry. It's to get you in ministry. I can lead you. Listen, I can, I can go do ministry. I can go preach in the convalescent homes every week. I love it. It's not my job. My job here is to get you out there and do it, is to shepherd you, is to be really concerned. Listen, have you ever had somebody you gave advice to and they didn't listen and you were glad they fell on your face? They fell on their face? <laughs> I told them, and they didn't listen. You're a leader. You're not a shepherd. A shepherd takes no pleasure. According to Ezekiel 18, you could read it later. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Lord said. Israel said, your ways are unfair. You're not equal. You're not equitable. The Lord said, my ways is your ways that are unfair. It's your ways that are unfair. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The heart of a shepherd. Now, for some of us, that's hard because especially here, let me tell you, you are surrounded in a church. This is a great story. The pastor told this story a couple of weeks ago. Let me explain to you how this works and how it's going to all fit in. This guy gets stuck on a deserted island. He's there for 20 years. After 20 years, he lights fires. He sends up smoke signals. He eats crabs every day. He catches fish. He's sick of seafood. 20 years he gets rescued. The boat pulls up to shore. They go out with the little dinghy. They get he rescued. He's dancing around. They see three huts. He goes, what's that first hut? He goes, that's where I lived. He goes, well, what's that second hut? Well, I'm a Christian. You know, I had to have a church. Well, what's that third hut? Well, that's the church I used to go to. So 
some of you guys have been around churches long enough, you know people go from church to church to church to church, and that's it, and the pastor did them wrong. For you all, you've seen people, you guys have been here more than six months, you've seen people come and go, and you wonder, what, what, what is that guy doing to these people that they come and go so much? What has he done to them? He seems like such a nice guy, and his wife loves him, and his kids are not. What does Ryan do? When no one's looking, he must be a terror. And then people leave, and you find out they're not walking with the Lord, and you go, ah, see, I told you. Listen to me. Anybody that's ever left this church, I want them to thrive. I don't want them to survive. I want them to... And listen, this is not my personality. This is not how I am. And the point that I was making that I told you all that story and everything is you've got, to, you've got to foster that. You've got to culture that. You've got to get that in your heart. Take no pleasure in the death of the... Somebody leaves the church, don't wish them ill. Don't wish them... The same way you want your son. You guys know the story of my brother. My brother all his life did drugs. All his life since he's 12 years old. Drugs, 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 drugs. The, the last 10 years of his life, I'd tell him, you can't come to my house no more, man. I can't have you around my kids, around my wife. He was full-blown demon-possessed by the time he was probably 18 years old. I can't have you around. And then when he died, I told my parents before, I told my parents, years, you're going to kill him with the love that you give him. You cannot keep giving him and giving him and giving him and giving. You can't keep winking. You can't, oh, he's doing great, now he's not doing it. You can't. You're going to kill him. Well, my brother's dead. You know what I did? I go around on the phone and say, see, you killed him. I hope you're happy. Of course not. Of course not. The heart of a shepherd, man. You, Christian, the heart of a shepherd, not just the heart of a leader, but you have to cultivate it. You got to find it. You got to ask for it. You got to look for it. You've got to be, if you're a lady in this place today, you got to look at the, and I use this term very carefully because I only mean it in the way that it's walking with the Lord, the elder women of the church. Not that there's any old women in our church, of course. There's no old women in our church. Least of all my wife. She's the youngest of the elders. You got to ask them, hey, can, can we get together for lunch sometime? Can I just run some questions by you? And you know, they might say, well, oh, today's a bad week. Tomorrow's a bad week. Today's a bad month. And you could either walk around going, nobody will get together with me. Nobody likes me. Or you can be persistent. You can say, okay, I'm going to ask you next week. Or I'm going to ask somebody else. You could be one of those young men in here who feel sorry for themselves because nobody wants to pour into you. Or you can keep digging and looking. Or you can also be one of those elder statesmen in here or elder stateswomen. And you can say, I have to find somebody to pour into. It works both ways. So this is a, uh, an encouragement and a rebuke, and an encouragement and a rebuke. Again, Moses. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Give me your attention. Here's the encouragement. I want you to take Joshua. He's the one. The spirit is strong on that one. Almost sounds like that, uh, what was that movie? Um, Star, wow, how did you know I was singing about that? Oh, okay. The spirit is strong on that one. Wow, that was really good, Tim. 
man knows his movies. <laughs> and I want you to get that guy, and I want, you to give, I want you to put your honor upon him. Now, how does that practically work? First of all, I want you to know the heart of somebody who wants to be discipled is there's a perfect picture in the book of Judges. Is it Judges? Is a perfect picture of it in the Bible. Elisha followed Elijah. Now, a lot of people, especially if you're new to Scripture, don't even remember that there was two of them. There was Elijah, and then there was Elisha. Elisha came after Elijah. Elijah did all these miracles in the name of the Lord. Elisha, you know what he did? He carried his stuff everywhere he went. And at times, Elijah would look at Elisha and go, you want to leave me alone? And he would say, no. Where you go, I go. Well, I'm going over there to die. You stay over here. No, I'm going with you. Can I have five minutes to breathe? No. He was not deterred. He was determined. He was not deterred. He was determined. He was not put aside. He stepped up. He said the very famous words, which everybody has heard because I've prayed over most of you. I want a double portion of your spirit. I want a double portion. Whatever you got, I want two of it. Whatever you can bless me with, give me two of it. I want a double portion of your spirit. Now, I don't mean to make him lose his reward nor blow smoke up his hind quarters, but Austin is my Elisha. He is continually pestering me with ridiculous questions. He's constantly calling me and showing up at my house and showing up at the gym. Constantly. Austin is like glue to my feet. And some days it frustrates me and I bark at him. And then every once in a while he doesn't show up and I miss him. And I go, what do you want? Double portion. Double portion. Leader, overseer, you see what he says, the Lord here? He says, I want you to set him before Eleazar, the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. You know what he wants you to do? He doesn't want you to go hush, hush. He wants you to let the people see. Let the people see you hanging with them. Um, we'll go to lunch, okay? We'll go to lunch. Just keep quiet. Won't my church be cool, though? No. He wants you to see. Now, I'll give you the for instance. You guys remember that homeless dude that was here for a while? Um, Craig? Every single week you came here, what did you see? Anybody? Get here a little bit early. You saw Big John pouring into him in the back. Wasn't afraid that he was a homeless guy, he looked homeless. Big John didn't care what he looked like. He gave him honor. He gave him legitimacy. He made the people honor Craig in their sight because he was not ashamed, not afraid. That's what we do. We give him honor in the sight of the people. Now, it was up to Craig whether he wanted to walk in that honor, whether he wanted to take advantage of that honor, whether he wanted to live in that honor. That was on Craig. Big John didn't care. Big John poured, and whether it got in or not, he was pouring, pouring out. Do you see what the spiritual application of our text tonight is? Verse 20 and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Verse 21. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and even the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Give me your attention, please. This is really... There is no spiritual explanation without taking like a long time. Does anybody remember the Urim and the Thurim? The priests used to wear the ephod. And at the top of this vest, which was called an ephod, there was these little, these little, uh, 
Well, they, they had the little uh, pockets and in it were the stones. And it was almost like, now this is really weird. It was almost like one of those magic eight balls. And they'd go to him and he'd say, hey, what do we do about this situation? What do we do about this? And the, and the priest would go, I don't know, let me see. And he mix the stones up and he'd pull one out and he'd go, go forward. Mix the stone up. Don't go anywhere. Now, we could break down the Urim and the Thurim meanings and explain the spiritual application of that, but here's what he said. I'm not going to talk to Moses the way I talk to you. I want him to go to priest, Eleazar the priest. The picture here is of the Lord Jesus with his, with his disciples, with his apostles, with us. The Lord spoke, God the Father spoke to the Son as a man hears another man, he heard the very voice of God. The leading of the Holy Spirit was so strong. But his teaching to us was, listen, you walk by faith, not by sight. You walk by faith and not by feeling. The application here for us is, listen, I want you to explain to Joshua. He's not going to hear me the way you hear me. He's going to have to go to the priest and inquire of the Urim and the Thurim. He's going to have to be in prayer, constant prayer. You're have to going to teach the people who you disciple to pray, to wait for the voice of the Lord, to get good, wise counsel. Somewhere along the line, and I know it happened to me, you will then be transformed into this Leader by prayer to this leader by the voice of God. I wish I could explain it to you better. Well, here's what happens. My pastor, who poured into me, Chet, he would beat me from one side to the other. Boom, boom, boom. He'd, he'd smack me around. He want, I want you to read this chapter every single day for the next month, and I want you to tell me how the Lord speaks to you about it. Okay, okay, okay. One day he even said to me, here, look, look what it says in John. My sheep hear my voice. Okay? Do you hear God's voice? I think I do. No, you don't. You read scripture. Okay, okay. Somewhere along the line, I don't know where it was, I started doing that to Austin. It's about the word of God. It was, it was somebody who said, Reading only the Word of God makes you dry up. Only praying makes you blow up. Doing both equally makes you grow up. If all you do is read Scripture without prayer, you get old and crusty. But if all you do is pray without reading Scripture, you get weird. But if you do both equally you will grow properly in the voice, hearing the voice of the Lord. And now I understand why Owen and Chet and all these people that poured into my life for so many years, listen, keep reading the Word. Keep reading. I don't know when God turns on that little clock of yours that all of a sudden one gift turns to another. I don't know when He does it, how He does it, why He does it, but all of a sudden I started hearing the voice of the Lord so now that I can pour this into other people without being weird, which is still sticking to Scripture. Great challenge to the shepherd. Great challenge to the shepherd. Some of the worst things I've ever done is I've asked people to step out of ministry. Horrible thing to do. Horrible thing. I've had people come to this church, serve faithfully in ministry, to find out that they're not showing up to church. All they want to do is show up to serve. And I've had to say, <laughs> and usually it's, Telling my wife, baby, you got to take them off the schedule. They can't serve no more. Oh, honey, that's what they live for. But they don't show up to church, baby. we got to do church. It's, I love people who serve, but they have to be involved in the body. And the first thing I do, what they do, is they come and see me. Did you tell your wife to take me off the schedule? I had to. How come? You have to be involved in the body. I have to be able to see you. Why? Because I'm the shepherd here. And they leave and they get involved in another church and ministry, and they go, see? And I go, praise God. 
they don't find any satisfaction. I take no pleasure. Like when somebody falls or somebody sicks, I want, if you're not making, do you understand there was somebody coming to church here for five plus years? And after five years of coming to church here, they were in the exact same place as the day I met them. And I said, I need you to go find another place to go to church. And he said, what are you talking about? You're not growing here. You're not getting it here. And I can't have you be a, a pew sitter. God has got much better plans for you. And you're not fulfilling them here. That's the heart of a shepherd. God gave me this heart. You know what the heart of a leader says? Don't worry about it. Just sit there. No problem. God, watch how I do this thing. Just come to church here. Bring some more people. No. The heart of a shepherd wants his sheep to grow and to learn. You who will shepherd other people. You who will be shepherded by other people. The Bible, listen, here's the crazy thing before we finish. We're almost going to be finished. I know there's a lot today. For some of us, salvation's enough. You come here, you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Praise God. You get to heaven, hallelujah. But for some, there's more. There's much more. The, the blessings of life. The Lord said in John 10.10, 10, I came to give you life and that abundantly. Somebody's at this church five years and there is no abundant life. There's only misery. What am I to do as a shepherd? Somebody is here a year and I'm not seeing fruit or abundance. And I say, you're walking with the Lord how many years? And this is still your life? Cigarettes, herb, porno. Go, go through. Come on, dude. You got to go find some place else to go. You threw them out of the church. They did nothing wrong. They did no sin against us. They did not sin at this church. They were sinning against themselves. I should have just let them sit here and grow, right? No shot. When I want to grow a church, you guys will know it. We'll start giving away free iPods like they do over at uh, Church by the Glades. Free Wii's. For the first 10 people who bring, you get a free Wii at, at, at Church by the Glades. Isn't that great? Doesn't that sound like a great church to go to? Church by the Glades. It's right up there. It's like 7,000 people go to church now. They got like 15 services a weekend. Man, you're in and out in a half hour. You don't even have to bring your Bible. Come on, man. You've done God your duty. You go to heaven, right? Verse uh, 21 again. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out and at his word they shall come in both he and all the children of the Israel with them, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. There's a unique thing. And he took, excuse me, Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Two things before we close. I want you to look at. Why, does anybody want to take a stab at why Moses told Joshua. God told Moses to tell Joshua to go see the priest Eleazar who will then inquire of the Urim. Because the most important thing that I can relay as a shepherd to the sheep is dependency. Dependency. As a shepherd, Moses looked very independent. As a shepherd, you think I am very independent. I go and I hear from God. I come and I report back to you. I leave here. I'll go. Um, midgets will bring me my dinner, my lunch. Um, the angels will carry uh, messages to me. And I'll come back and on Sunday I'll give you a new message. No. I am very... Midgets is a really bad word these days, isn't it? Sorry, baby. Yeah, little people. Sorry, baby. My wife loves that show, Little People. Big world. If any little people here, I'm sorry. I come from a different time and place. I'm sorry. Listen. 
Moses wanted Joshua to know you must not be independent, you must be dependent. If you knew how much that I lean on Austin, on Lee, on Dustin, on my father-in-law, if you knew, you might not come to church here, what a mess I am sometimes. And they put me back together and they pour me back here. And he was trying to explain that. You who shepherd and you are being shepherded. Where two or more are gathered, I am in your midst. Because one person can be very self-deceived, thinking they hear things from the Lord that he did not say. That's why the Lord said that. And if you've been around a church any amount of time, in a church, and somebody comes to you, the Lord showed me something. Well, where did you hear this from? Well, I was in prayer. Well, can you find that in Scripture? No. Then it wasn't God. Oh, no, no, no. The Lord spoke to me. If you can't find it in Scripture, it wasn't of the Lord. No, no, the Lord definitely told me. You see, I had one guy one time tell me, you know, he wasn't really dead for three days. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, everybody in the church thinks that God was dead for three, that Jesus Christ was dead for three days and rose again. I said, no, they don't. It says on the third day he rose again. Ah, but look, it was a Friday. A and I was like, Dude, what are you talking about? The Lord revealed this to me. And he was going to go spread it to the church. And I was like, your logic is really, really worldly, but it's not biblical, bro. But the Lord showed it to me. You can't, you can't dispute that. He's right. But it's stupid. Well, he was sure. Um, secondly, uh, turn, please, to Matthew 23. Here's where we close. Matthew 23. And just for you married men and women here, do you see what I use as a bookmarker? It's a picture of my wife and daughters. I love you, baby. I'm going to be in trouble later on a midget remark. The shepherd, the good shepherd, he knows when to be kind and gentle. He knows when to be loving. Start at um, let me find it. Verse 37, chapter 23. I want, to go, I want to do this in reverse. Look at verse 37. The Lord Jesus, the perfect picture of the heart of a woman and the strength of a man. He is the perfect picture. He has all the greatest attributes of a woman and all the finest attributes of a man. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He had the heart that said he wanted to just, man, I want to just pick you up under my wings. And you keep running away, and I just, the heart of a woman. Yeah. It's the craziest thing to see a woman with a wayward son. Even worse, see a grandmother taking care. Has anybody ever seen a grandmother trying to take care of her grandson? Trying to raise a grandmother who raises a grandson. It is the worst case scenario. It cannot work. Now, I say that most of the time. There are situations where it has worked. However, the vast majority of the time, a grandmother stuck in between wanting to give that kid everything. And the kid will he will rob her, and he will just think about the absolute worst possible things that could happen, and the grandmother will still love this child. She will show up to court, and she will say, no, he's a good boy, he's a good boy. He's a murderer. We laugh because, let me tell you, 
You go to court any amount. If you've been to court as many times as me and my wife have, and we've seen the things, you see it. People on trial for murder. People on trial for robbery. People on trial. And there's the grand. He's a good boy. He, no, no. You think he's a good boy. That's the heart of a woman. That's the gentlest, giving is forgive. It's beautiful. However, look at the heart of a true shepherd. He says, look at verse, just, just part of what he says to them in verse 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of uncleanness. Listen, give me your attention. Let me explain it to you. You can read the whole thing for homework because I don't want to be misunderstood here. The Lord Jesus shepherded people and he shepherded them without giving them everything they wanted. He gave them what they needed. A true shepherd and not a leader, let me explain to you the difference. We had a couple in our church. They were leaders. And they were great at counseling. And they were great at telling people how to raise their children. And they did counseling ministries at our church. And they were wonderful people. And they loved children. And they would sit down with couples and they would tell them how to do it. And they would give them techniques on parenting skills and spankings. And they would give them. But when it didn't work, you know what they would do? They would cut ties with those people because it didn't work. That is a leader. You know what a shepherd has to do? He has to still be there through the good and the bad. And a shepherd says... You're killing yourself. You're killing yourself. And when you kill yourself, I'll be there. And when you go to court, I'll be there. And when you fall down, I'll be there. A leader can turn around and leave and go, well, I'm going in this direction. If you want to go, you're welcome to come with me. And there's nothing wrong with that heart. But the shepherd, he'll be there. As long as you want me to be there, I'll be there. You'll have to run from me. You threw me out of the church and now you're going to call me and see how I'm doing? Of course. Well, if you love me so much, why did you ask me to leave your church? Because I love you so much. The Lord Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, he tried one last time and he did what only a good shepherd will do. He put the major smack down on him. You're a fool. You're a whitewashed tomb. On the outside, oh, aren't you pretty? But in the inside, you're dead men. But when he all finished with the big smack down, with the woe unto you, he called them blind guides. He called them vipers. He called them every name in the book. You know why? To do this. Wake up! When it was over, his heart of compassion and the heart of a shepherd, not the heart of a leader that goes, you know what, fine, I've tried everything. The heart of a shepherd, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those that I sent to you, how I wanted to gather your children together. I wanted to gather you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't have it. Now look at your house. It's left you desolate. There's nothing left of it. And then he went up on a cross, died and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. What? If it was me, it'd be like, kill them, Father. They know exactly what they did. <laughs> Good thing it wasn't me. We'd all be in trouble. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example that you've given us in Moses. God, I know that, I know that when he got to heaven, he was not disappointed. Not getting to see the promised land. I know it. Because you went and prepared a place for him. If it wasn't so, you would have told him, I know it. God, if there is any 
one person here that does not have a relationship first with you and then with the church. God, put it in their heart. Some people, they're so shy, God. Some people are so even sinfully shy. And they won't ask and they can't ask. God, give them boldness. Your word says that the righteous are bold as a lion. And I thank you, God, for the shepherds that are here, the leaders that are here. I thank you for them. God, make your leaders shepherds. But they would shepherd the people of God, as your word says so plainly, shepherd the people of God. God, if there's connections that need to be made, either be it today or be it Sunday, God, may it be a, a God thing. May the Elisha, Elijah relationships begin. May the Timothy and Paul relationships begin. May the, the Timothy and Silas relationships and the, and the Timothy and, you know them all, God. Please, Lord, may the hearts that are here receive your word and be forever changed. We love and thank you, God. Have your way 